Well, we all, we all like predictability. We would like to learn what happens in the next 10 years, have some idea. Um, so how do we deal with chaos? So our next speaker is going to talk about the unpredictable. Alexic Eskin um, is a professor in the Department of Mathematics at the University of Chicago. And he made important contributions to geometric group theory, ergodic theory, I have no idea what that is, um, and number theory, but I'm sure we're going to learn about it. Um, so his, his uh, um, specialties include mathematical billiards um, and rational polygons. His contributions have earned him this year's uh, breakthrough prize in mathematics. Um, and I think that's one of the wonderful things about uh, these awards is that they go all the way from life sciences to physics um, into mathematics. So Alex's talk is Structure Hidden in Chaos. So there is structure in there, past and future. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alex to the stage. It's hiding in the back. Anybody know what a gothic theory is? Hands, please. Ah. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for a wonderful introduction. So, I don't know. I mean, I think that a lot of this talk will be a little bit mysterious. It's hard to talk about mathematics to a general audience in such a short time. Uh, but, <laughs> I'll try to show you some pictures and hopefully everything will be okay. Uh, so there'll be no quiz. So let me start with something called uh, a theorem which really inspired me very much. It's called the Ratner theorem. It's by Marina Ratner, who was a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. She died very recently. And she proved this amazing theorem in 1991. And I'm not showing you a statement of it, but it's some, something about certain motion and homogeneous spaces. Homogeneous spaces are spaces where everything, every point looks like every other point. And it's somehow, maybe the theme of this talk is this kind of theorem sometimes reveals certain hidden structures and chaotic phenomena. If you can see something, it kind of looks very random, but if you know exactly where to look, you look something very, very structured. And here is maybe a quote from Alain Dindersaus, the field medalist in mathematics, and he says that, remarkable about this theorem is that somehow how many different applications they had. By application, I mean application to other parts of mathematics. There is no, no actual, it's mostly to things like number theory and so on. But it's, it's sort of, uh, it's something which kind of allows mathematicians to kind of go off in different directions and prove results, which would be very difficult to obtain by other means. And uh, what Mary Mirzakhani and I proved and, uh, was, and this was something which we worked on for a long time, and this was, is essentially an analog of Ratner's theorem, but for objects which are not homogeneous, they're called moduli spaces. So I don't think I want to define all of this. Uh, let me just show you. Uh, so, but one of the directions for the next 10 years is really my own personal, is I want to prove more theorems of this type. I want to kind of find other theorems which have similar kind of features and they will maybe allow us to find structures, and unexpected structures in different areas. But, uh, so maybe I should actually, let me just show you the scary slide. Here is the theorem. <laughs> don't read this, you don't, you're not expect to read this. Uh, but for a mathematician, this is actually not a difficult statement to understand. What is difficult about it is the proof. The proof of this theorem is more, is a shortest known proof is more than 80 pages of really hard arguments. And, and it's, uh, the original proof was actually more than 300 pages, but it's been somewhat uh, simplified. But uh, now, what I'm going to talk about for a, a, a little bit, uh, for most of the rest of the talk, I'm going to talk about recent results, 
which don't use uh, this theorem, but the, the, the theorem that uh, Mirzakhani and I proved. So these are like results in which that plays a role, and that's kind of a, uh, a kind of marker for the kind of results we want to see in the future in, in the next 10 years. Uh, so we should be able to, if you prove more analogs of Ratner's theorem, we should be able to see more results of a similar flavor. So anyway, let's just, uh, is possible to see what um, uh, this thing, so this is a particular polygon, and we're gonna play pool. So we're gonna just bounce a billiard ball around this particular polygon. The angles are marked over there. It's important to have exactly these specific angles, and so when you play pool, the angle of incidence is the angle of reflection, because the billiard ball is actually, it's mathematics, so it's not an actual ball, it's a point which is reflecting off the sides. So, and what I'm gonna talk about is I'm gonna talk about what's called periodic trajectories. These are trajectories which kind of keep on going forever, so, and they'll kind of repeat themselves. So if you reflect off this wall and then you're gonna reflect off the other wall, you're gonna back and gonna reflect off the original wall and can go on forever. And so this is called a periodic trajectory. It has a period which is really its length. And uh, this is, I think, the shortest one in that particular polygon. And now I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but I kind of wanted to, is there, it's somehow what happens kind of passes near this corner, which is at seven pi over five over five. It doesn't actually hit this corner, it just passes near it, just an artifact of how my computer uh, drew this uh, picture. So this is the shortest one. And now let's look at the next one. This is the next one. Again, it doesn't really pass through this corner at seven pi over five, it kind of passes very near it. And it's, it also has a length or a period, and its length is actually exactly the golden mean one plus root five over two times the length of the red one. So, so you probably can't see it, but it's true. If you want to compute this, you can compute this. And now here are the next two, by ordered by length. And again, they come in pairs. There is a red one and there is a blue one, and the blue one is exactly gold mean as long as the, as the red one. And here is another gun, and here is its friend. Again, the friend is exactly golden length, golden ratio as long as the blue one. This kind of like, seems like a very, very weird pattern. Why, uh, why do they come in pairs? Or what is the reason for behind this? Or how generic is this? Should be, it should be very, very special. Here are a few more. By the way, a lot of this stuff is done by, I mean, this was originally discovered by computer experimentations, and one of the weird things for which we really don't understand at all is that uh, you can find things which we would might call false positives. There are things, you can compute this uh, trajectories for a while, and for, and for a while it seems like you see a pattern like this and then it stops working. And we really don't understand the reason for that. But anyway, let me show you some theorems. This is a theorem uh, somehow for this particular polygon, this pattern goes on forever. We check like 100,000 trajectories by computer before we try to prove a theorem. And it actually does work. There is, there is a theorem, and this is a theorem which is, this is a joint work with Kurt McMullen, Roland Mukamal, Alan Wright, Alex Wright, and myself. And so again, you look at this particular polygon, uh, and you look at the lengths of the periodic trajectories, and then the, it, what this says is the lengths come in pairs whose ratio is exactly the golden mean, which is exactly the statement I was saying before. So this is, a, this is basically just this, what I just mentioned before. Now, one weird thing about it is that if I look at this polygon again, I, this is a quadrilateral. Now, if you have a triangle and I specify the angles, I know the triangle up to scaling, right? I basically know what the triangle is up to this complete rescaling, which doesn't really do anything in this. But if I have a quadrilateral and I specify the angles, I don't know the quadrilateral. I still have a one parameter family of such objects. I can move, I can move some of the sides and keep the same angles. And what this theorem says is this pattern exists is this, uh, no matter which quadrilateral with those angles I have. And this is something which is kind of, if you think about this, extremely strange and unexpected because if you think about, this is really a theorem about, I mean, the in interesting thing about it is very long trajectories. If you start uh, looking at these very long trajectories and then you start moving the sides of the polygon, everything, eventually you'll hit some complete chaos. Everything will be different. Nothing will remain the same. On the other hand, this particular pattern of these trajectories coming in pairs somehow persists. And 
so this is why the serum is very, very surprising. We actually really didn't expect such a, such a thing to ever, ever exist. And uh, so because there, again, because there is such one parameter. And now here is another, let me sh sh throw something again which you're not supposed to understand. Uh, uh, the proof goes through some another theorem. Uh, this is a I, statement, I'm not even gonna read it. It's a statement in a field of mathematics called algebraic geometry, which is very, very far removed from this kind of polygons and dynamics and so on. It's, ab it's about solutions to polynomial equations. And it's sort of something which is uh, you know, quite sophisticated in mathematics, I mean, at least to me. And it somehow says that two very high dimensional shapes in some space somehow have intersect each other more than expected. And um, somehow, you well anyway, but I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna say it, but I'm just gonna say there is a lot of stuff here going on behind the scenes to actually understand what happens in that particular polygon takes a lot of advanced mathematics. But now let me just maybe try to look a little bit more broadly. So polygons are uh, called rational if all angles are ratios of whole numbers. And just in terms of how little we understand about the mathematics of this stuff, without this assumption, we don't even know if a tri every triangle has a periodic billiard trajectory. This is like something looks like an easy problem, but it's, it's, it's actually very difficult. So let's just stick to this rationality assumption. So now is the rational, uh, is the, the reason rational polygons are easier is because you can kind of, given a rational polygon, you can construct a surface in such a way that the polygons, the billiard trajectories on the polygon correspond to straight lines on the surface. And the idea here is, uh, so if I have this billiard trajectory, I can, instead of reflecting the billiard, I can actually reflect the surface. And so I can make, make four copies of this polygon to make this kind of, uh, kind of torus-like shape and then on, on this surface, I just, uh, the straight lines, the billiard trajectories become straight lines. And again, this is the more complicated example. If I start with this polygon, I get this regular tangon with opposite sides identified. And somehow here, if you, because you're identifying the opposite sides, all the blue points become the same point and all the green points be become the same point, which means that uh, at, at the green point and also the blue point, you get a cone angle, which is not two pi, but here it's four pi. So it's a kind of a conical singularity. So anyway, so here is the, sorry, I'm pressing the wrong button. Now, now what happens here is that if you have, when you have a single trajectory, you kind of have a, a lot of friends. It has trajectories which are parallel to itself. So the, you really should be counting cylinders of periodic trajectory. Anyway, here is what happens to the, now I've done the same proce procedure, but for the, poly, uh, for the quadrilateral in the original picture. And now what you see is you see again these kind of cylinders of periodic trajectories and the amazing thing here is they come in pairs. There's always, a red, uh, there's always one which I labeled red, another one which is labeled blue. And the blue cylinder is actually exactly golden mean as big both length and width as the red one. And so again, this picture kind of persists. Uh, sometimes the cylinders are, um, here I'm just looking different directions. Sometimes they're both kind of long and thin, sometimes they're both kind of Sometimes they, together they cover very little of the first one, sometimes, but still this, this, ra this kind of, you still have ratio of the golden mean. And now this is not unique to this particular quadrilateral. Uh, it turns out there are actually, we know of six such quadrilaterals. And somehow when we're discovering them, the first one was actually, was actually the one I described, but it was not described as a quadrilateral. It was described in some other shape, which was very difficult to work with. But then there was another one, which was realized to be quadrilateral, and then the first one also known to be quadrilateral. And then we had a sort of a competition. And my colleagues were trying to understand stuff by just kind of writing things on a piece of paper, and I started just programming this thing for all quadrilaterals with small angles, and the angles which are like small denominators, and we started competing. So the, the third and fourth and fifth example were found by my computer program, but the sixth example it was actually found by the human before the computer got to it. The computer will gotten to it eventually. So they, in some sense, the humans have won. Uh, uh, and so, so there are exactly six of those and they're all quadrilaterals. And the question is, are there more? Uh, we have no idea if there are more or we don't. This is actually one of the more uh, important questions in this area is, is there a Pentagon in which this kind of this kind of similar properties. It will have situations where the periodic trajectories will come in triples, not in pairs. 
And this has, has to do with the import, very important for this particular theory. It will ask, well, if there is, anyway, I'm not gonna read this, but it's, uh, it's something which is kind of one, one of the most important open questions in AI. And anyone can look for this thing. I mean, we just have no idea. Yeah, and uh, so the questions for the next 10 years is the classification of these kind of objects. We have no idea what they look like. We might think that they are coming, uh, they're kind of like finite simple groups. So there's maybe some infinite families and there may be some, we may, we may already know where all the infinite families come from, but there are lots of sporadic examples which have no idea. But anyway, we can't really prove anything. We don't even know what the pictures look like. And we really, basically we do expect there should be more examples which you need to find. And in fact, the qu we actually had conjectures about this, but the thing that I started the talk with is actually a counterexample to most of the conjectures. So we really don't know what, what to expect. And we, uh, one of the questions really whether we can anything about the counterexamples. Anyway, here is another thing uh, which is kind of comes from the same kind of uh, theorem, uh, like the analog of Ratner's theorem. This is called the elimination problem. And here you have a room, imagine the room is made out of mirrors. And if, if you imagine you put, uh, so Y is eliminated from X, if there is a build objective going from X to Y, and you think of putting a candle at X and seeing if Y is in the light or in the dark. And uh, so here is the theorem, which was based on our theorem. It says for any rational polygon at any point, there are at most finitely many points which are not eliminated. So if you put a candle in such a polygonal room, you will, everything will become light uh, because the walls are mirrors, other than some maybe finding many points. Essentially, everything will be lighted. So the, the title of their paper is Everything is Illuminated. <laughs> and here is another kind of thing which comes out. Imagine that you, this is a very old physical model of, of something, actually I'm not sure exactly of what. Uh, but it's like there is a point particle running around infinite array, uh, array of rectangular obstacles. It's maybe some sort of gas or I don't know. And you can, the question you can ask is like, how far away does it get? So if you start going in some direction, how far after like you go for some time T, how far do you get? And uh, somehow you can look at this expression. Basically it's T to the two thirds. That's what, we, what followed from the theorem, which is very unusual. You expect one half, but not two thirds. And that somehow the answer kind of is independent of the shape of obstacles you can put. So if you put this kind of thing, it's again the same to the two thirds. It's kind of, you would think that this is harder to, this one is also the same two thirds. Now this one is not, it's a different answer. But if you remove a few more squares, it's like back to two thirds. So it's quite, quite mysterious what's going on in there. And you can also figure out what happens in these kind of shapes and these kind of shapes and so on. So there is an exact formula for what happens for this kind of thing. And really, uh, in the future, we really basically want to understand, prove more theorems of this type, and we hope that to see somehow more hidden structure of this type. Okay, thanks. Can you, can you explain to a biologist what you mean by false positives? In, if you prove a theorem, I would, if you prove a theorem, I would you know for assume sure. that there are no false positives. Anyway. No, if you prove a theorem, you know for sure. But imagine that you have some sort of experiment you're running. And it, 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 I mean, for example, in this thing, we are looking at uh, this build trajectories and we see those parallel, uh, the, every, they come in pairs. So, if you prove a theorem that they always come in pairs, you know they always come in pairs. But what if you didn't prove a theorem? Instead, you just saw that the first uh, 50 came in pairs. Do you know that all of them come in pairs or not? And you'll probably say maybe 50 is enough. But we call, this, we call those things false positives because sometimes you, first 50 do come in pairs, but maybe the 57th does not have a friend. Who, uh, and so that's kind of, is this in, in terms of like, uh, we are, in some sense we are false, we are making a computer experiment and the computer kind of suggests certain things and sometimes the data is very, very misleading. I certainly don't want to make this any more complicated, but your illustrations seem to be all in two dimensions. What happens when you take it to three dimensions? It becomes extremely complicated. We really don't know what to do. <laughs>
yeah, somehow the problem is these kind of systems are kind of notorious. They're very, very difficult to analyze. They're easy to visualize, but they are difficult to deal with. And the way we deal with them is by connecting this to some other system in a completely different branch of math, and there we understand something, and then we go back to this. And in three dimensions, we don't know how to make this connection. Um, what is the significance of having one of the trajectories uh, be uh, have the golden mean proportional to the first projection? It's just a weird fact. I mean, those are the six quadrilaterals. This particular one I showed you had this golden mean. Is a, some of the other quadrilaterals will have different numbers, but again, they always come in pairs which are proportional to each other. And the proportionality concept is the same, depending only on the polygon. So sometimes it may be not the golden mean, sometimes maybe root two. So maybe you'll have trajectories come in pairs which are one of them is root two times the other. It's just somehow it's a very weir weird pattern. It's some sort of a very hidden structure. And uh, it's something which is kind of, I mean, I'm not saying you are gonna cu uh, cure patients with this, but it's uh, very different, I mean, it's very unexpected for a mathematician. Yeah. Can you help, help us understand what do you expect might emerge from understanding the hidden structure that you're exploring? Well, we don't know exactly. Uh, which, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. Thank you so much, Alex. Okay.